to get a sense of who here in this room is familiar with the hashtag you stink uh, campaign that happened in Lebanon uh, this past summer. Okay, so about a third, third of you. Has anyone here heard of the uh, massive mobilizations that happened in Baghdad last summer uh, around the same time due to electricity cuts in the city? Okay, a little less, but there's some familiarity. So just to give some background, the Ustink um, campaign is not going to be the focus of my talk, but it was very visible in the media. Um, it was a campaign that mobilized around the um, longstanding pro uh, problem of uh, garbage piling up in the city of Beirut um, and eventually being displaced to other parts of the city um, that was seen as sort of a very apt metaphor for the crisis of government um, that has been going on for a long, long time. At the same time in Baghdad, um, in Baghdad's Tahrir Square, not Cairo's, thousands of citizens mobilized around claims to uh, another set of very basic rights um, that they claimed as modern urban residents. As temperatures topped 122 degrees Fahrenheit, Baghdadis received only a few hours of electricity per day. But if you've been following events in Iraq since 2003, you know that this is not actually a new phenomenon at all. Um, about one to three hours of electricity per day has been average um, throughout the last, uh, uh, the entirety of the occupation and aftermath of the invasion of Iraq. So, and for that matter, as I mentioned in Lebanon, the garbage crisis was not a new phenomenon either. So what happened last summer? Uh, what, what is new is that this summer, young Iraqi activists who actually identified themselves largely as secular uh, mobilize around the insufferable conditions of the summer heat and use the mass mobilization to get people out onto the streets um, as a platform to demand an overhaul of the sectarian political regime in Iraq. Today I'm going to share with you what is at the root of this recent wave of demonstrations in Baghdad, because as in Lebanon, the case that more people seem to be familiar with, mounds of rotting garbage and the lack of electricity in Baghdad are not actually the root problem but rather are painful symptoms of much deeper and foundational problems that exist at the scales of the national government and also at the scale of municipal urban space. This summer, this past summer, young organizers used the immediacy and the unbearable nature of the garbage rotting in their streets and the electricity that was suffocating them in the heat, the lack of electricity, as catalysts for calls to action, demanding both an overhaul of the entrenched sectarianism and also new accountability for the corruption that had been paralyzing people's access to basic urban rights in Lebanon and Iraq, respectively. So for the rest of my talk today, I'm going to focus on Baghdad. In particular, I want to tell you the story of how, in this city, where citizens have historically organized their political communities and social movements around identities and causes rooted in labor struggles, women's rights, and anti-imperialism uh, uprisings, how only in the past decade have ethno-sectarian identities, that is labels of Shia, Sunni, Kurd, have only recently have they been made to matter most of all. Today, sectarian identity has a disproportionate role in determining how a person moves throughout Baghdad. The jobs and schools that he or she has access to, the world in which he or she socializes, and the political parties that he or she votes for. Again, I have to emphasize that this was not the case for the majority of Baghdad's residents throughout the entire 20th century. What I'm going to describe today is a 21st century phenomenon and a condition that's a direct consequence of the US-led invasion and occupation of Iraq. And I'm going to repeat that because if there's one thing that I want you to take away from my talk today um, and my argument, it's that this is a 21st century condition and a direct consequence of the U.S.-led led invasion and occupation of Iraq. Sectarian-based segregation of Sunni and Shia residents is a very recent phenomenon, as I'm saying in Baghdad. It's one that's characterized by the proliferation of concrete blast walls throughout the city, like this one, that it started appearing since um, 2006 in the way that I'm going to describe. Attempts to normalize these separation walls have ranged from military planning, planning rhetoric, calling them the building of gated communities in Baghdad, to subsequent municipal campaigns that were intended to beautify the concrete barriers by transforming them into a citywide canvas for a new visual urban culture of murals. 
with historical and cultural references painted on them. Meanwhile, local residents have invented creative tactics and temporary solutions to work around, over, and through the everyday obstacles imposed by this new spatial condition of division in Baghdad. As built forms, <coughs> the walls are more than mere instruments of division. They're actually physical manifestations of, recent, of a recent condition of sectarian-based segregation that has characterized the Iraqi capital since 2006 and the Iraqi government since 2003. Before 2006 and throughout the modern history of Iraq, what was normal was for urban residents to live and work together in shared communities, families, and neighborhoods, irrespective of their Shia or Sunni identity. Before the occupation, urban residents could traverse the city without concern over sectarian difference within the population. Indeed, uh, I've heard stories from those who I've interviewed describing the way that uh, Sunni families would celebrate Ashura with their uh, Shia neighbors. Intermarriage was not terribly uncommon between um, Sunni and Shia families. And so again, just wanted to emphasize, this is a 21st century phenomenon, um, the idea that Sunni and Shia should not be able to live together. The new political significance and the spatial meaning of sectarian difference has turned the social worlds of Baghdadis on its head. The segregated city is actually unrecognizable to most Iraqis today, I think it's safe to say. So I want to recognize and begin to unpack the deep and long-standing impacts of the US-led invasion and occupation on uh, Iraq and on the city. And I'm going to focus, in order to do this, I'm going to focus on the most dramatic period of transformation of the urban space in Baghdad between February of 2006 and February of 2007. So a quick note on urbanism and our understanding of sort of uh, destruction or uh, the destruction of cities um, or violence in cities at the scale of uh, the urban. So as distant observers, uh, as we often are, sitting at Stanford, um, studying, thinking about, discussing the, the, the Middle East um, and, and other cities, we digest the idea of the demolition of buildings, the destruction of infrastructure, and the raising of neighborhoods, much like what the world witnessed in Israel's assault on Gaza in 2014, pictured here, as the most visible consequences of wars on cities and the aftermath of aerial bombardments and ground invasions by occupying forces. No one can look at an image like this and argue that this is a, this is a symptom, right, of a violent act of, of the destruction of a city. However, in the context of war and occupation, the built environment also undergoes a constant and sometimes less obvious or less spectacular uh, or less visible process of creative destruction. In other words, a radical erasure and a remaking of social spatial geographies through the productive process and political decision-making and military interventions, in the case of Iraq, by the occupying forces. As I'll show, decisive and divisive political decision-making by the United States occupying government institutionalized sectarian quotas in Iraq's system of government and subsequent militarized interventions in urban space um, by the US-led multinational forces, which established a new spatial condition um, of urban segregation in the capital. So my aim today is in part to unsettle the problematic assumption um, that, that we heard a lot, particularly in the early days of the rise of sectarian violence in Baghdad uh, in 2006, um, an assumption that, um, that the sectarian-based violence and segregation was some kind of inevitable outcome of removing Saddam Hussein from power, or in effect taking the lid off um, long-standing bottled up sectarian tensions. So to do this, to undermine that assumption, for the remainder of my talk, I'm first going to explain how the decisions at the level of the national government, sanctioned by the US-led occupation, work to institutionalize the political significance of sectarian difference. Then I will show how self-identified Sunni and Shia parties emerged within this political framework and effectively consolidated territory to transform the city into a network of Sunni and Shia-identified zones between 2006 and 2007. And then to conclude, I'll examine subsequent militarized strategies of building concrete security barriers, as they were called, between urban neighborhoods and their effective cementing of segregated enclaves, um, planned according to modern politics of sectarianism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
After the US-led multinational forces declared war on Iraq in March of 2003 and succeeded in invading the country, the United States established the Coalition, Coalition Provisional Authority, or the CPA, as we've, we've heard it referred to, uh, to assume control in place of the toppled Ba'ath regime. Without Senate confirmation, President George W. Bush appointed Paul Bremer as the presidential envoy and administrator of the CPA, so in a sense, the ruler of, of Iraq following the invasion. Bremer executed a succession of decrees, appointments, and pressures that ultimately served to reproduce, magnify, and codify differential treatment of Shias and Sunnis as the foundation of what was being described as Iraq's, the bedrock for a, a dem democratic political <coughs> system in Iraq uh, within the span of two years. Working in cooperation with exiled Shia politicians who had vowed to eliminate the power base of the former Ba'ath regime, the CPA facilitated the emergence of a sectarian <coughs> government in Baghdad. In sum, this new logic of power failed to address the problematic sectarian favoritism that had been formerly exercised and exploited by Saddam Hussein in numerous ways. Um, but instead of undoing those divisions, it signaled the institutionalization of sectarian politics, and all under, again, this banner of democracy building, which we heard again and again. The bedrock of political sectarianism in Iraq since 2003 was formed 10 days after the invasion, when Paul Bremer signed CPA, CPA Orders Number 1 and 2 to debathify Iraqi society and dissolve all government ministries, political organizations, and military entities affiliated with the previous regime. Former Ba'ath members and officials were categorically barred from participation in Iraq's future government. Irrespective of their allegiance to the former regime, and uh, Sunnis who had served in the army were economically and politically marginalized overnight. In short, the monolithic and oversimplified approach of debathification reproduced differential treatment of citizens based on crude ethno-sectarian categorizations. Sunni Arabs were effectively equated with Saddam loyalists, while Shia Arabs and Sunni Kurdish groups were assumed to represent um, an opposition to the former regime. And this is a critique that members of the CPA have even um, uh, express themselves in that, in the <clears throat> retrospectively. In July 2003, Paul Bremer established uh, what was called the Interim Governing Council. And this was intended to be the principal body of the Iraqi interim administration uh, that would lay the foundation for a democratic system in Iraq. Uh, he established this without seeking official consensus from any uh, previous or former Iraqi leaders. And the IGC, the Governing Council, was comprised of Ayad Alawi, who's pictured here uh, in the middle, who would eventually become the interim prime minister. And other members appointed according to sectarian criteria, um, according to that sort of overgeneralization I described, um, that favored the previously exiled Shia opposition leaders to Saddam's regime. <coughs> Membership was determined according to an identity-based quota system that predetermined a Shia majority. Consequently, the first general elections in Iraq on 2005, January of 2005 were transformed into confessional exercises wherein citizens were encouraged to vote according largely uh, based on sectarian identities above else. Political parties um, became identified primarily with one sect or the other. That said, resistance to the CPA's hand in crafting the political future of Iraq came in many different forms, from public demonstrations to voting vote uh, vote, voting boycotts. Dissent was increasingly led by socioeconomically and dis disenfranchised and politically marginalized Sunnis, again, because of uh, the result of debathification policies. <clears throat> the sectarian based boycott of the January 2005 elections by a major bloc of Sunni representatives and voters, represented by the uh, uh, Iraq Islamic Party, the major Sunni <laughs> Islamic Party, ensured that because of the boycott, uh, there was a victory of Shia leadership, and uh, the majority government was in the hands of, of Shia parties that were handpicked by the CPA. The new constitution drafted and ratified under the new government worked to codify the ethno-sectarian basis of Iraq's new political system from 2005. And by December 2005, parliamentary elections resulted in a resounding Shia majority government and attacks by insurgent militias in Baghdad engaged in explicitly and blatantly sectarian discourse um, from that point forward. 
Early resistance, I should note to the foreign occupation, what we heard about is the insurgency in the early days, um, had initially included uh, both Sunnis and Shia. Um, and so the Mahdi army, controlled by Muqtada al-Sadr, and all these groups of disenfranchised uh, Sunnis, which came as a result from debaqification, represented sort of a, a broad-based insurgency <coughs> against the occupation, so an anti-occupation insurgency. Um, however, by mid-2004, um, before the elections, this fell apart, and political sectarianism was, was taking root, as I described, through the work of the Governing Council and the January 2005 elections. Um, so what happened was that uh, leadership of the insurgency fell under al-Zarqawi, who you might know as the founder of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Um, and a self-identified Sunni insurgency was then galvanized. So the insurgency itself took on a very sectarian character by 2005. Um, and eventually the, the target of the insurgency became not just uh, representations of the occupation by the foreign uh, forces, but actually um, uh, retaliation and attacks against explicitly religious Shia symbols, um, places, communities, and uh, I'll, I'll go into more depth describing that. One of the outcomes of the 2005 elections was also the empowerment of the Shia Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, um, the party that, that uh, holds the most power, uh, and they control the interior ministry. And um, also as a result, the militarized arm of the Shia parties, um, the Badr organization, uh, has been documented to have used during this period, um, late 2005, early 2006, uh, the police force, so the official forces of the Iraqi government in Baghdad to target Sunni insurgent groups like Al-Qaeda in Iraq. <laughs> So um, in ways that were not just about counterinsurgency strategies, but took on a very dark uh, character. And I can go to more depth in the discussion to describe those if you're interested. <coughs> in general, bombings, kidnappings, and assassinations in Baghdad, previously that were driven by a generalized resistance to foreign occupation, became explicitly linked to sectarian-based militias working either with in or in resistance to the newly formed Iraqi government after the 2005 elections. Sunni and Shia insurgent groups identified and targeted vulnerable communities, families, and individuals according to presumed sectarian identities. And by early 2006, militia groups began to divide Baghdad into Sunni and Shia identified zones through a violent and systematic strategy of internal displacement, which I'll describe in some detail. <clears throat> so this is February of 2006. Um, this is this is the event that sort of marks the period of the rise um, of sectarian based <coughs> violence that completely transformed Baghdad. So it's sort of the uh, one of the major catalysts we can call it for the period I'm going to describe moving forward. In late February 2006, militants detonated explosive inside the Alaskari Mosque in Samara, which is near Baghdad, demolishing the golden dome of the sacred Shia shrine. Um, this photo appeared everywhere in the New York Times, The Guardian, I mean, it was, it was really an image that um, was circulated around the world, um, and for a good reason. This attack was the most spectacular incidence of sectarian-based violence witnessed to that date. The Shia-controlled interior <coughs> ministry and paramilitary Mahdi army, uh, the paramilitary force that belonged to the Shia cleric, Muqtada al-Sadr, retaliated this uh, event with a citywide campaign of attacks that were targeting Sunni militia fighters as well as civilians. So it took on a new character following this, this uh, event. Muqtada al-Sadr also set in motion an aggressive campaign that sought to establish Shia majorities in areas of the city controlled by his paramilitary as a means to amass political as well as economic power in the capital. In addition to armed militia and uh, armed militia conflict and political assassinations, territorial expansion involves strategic practices intended to eliminate Sunni or Shia civilians from designated areas of the city. So as I'm saying, it changed from uh, explicitly sort of a militia-based conflict to one that really targeted everyday people and their everyday lives who maybe had nothing to do with directly affiliating with any militia um, and forced them out of their homes. Um, this is a map of Baghdad prior to February 2006, 
Um, and it illustrates a predominance of what we call uh, mixed neighborhoods as a very sort of retrospective term. So the normal kind of heterogeneous neighborhood that you would find in Baghdad, represented here in orange, um, would be one where you would find you know, approximately equal uh, distribution of residents of Sunni and Shia families and households. Um, in green, you see areas that, you, that were described um, and documented as being predominantly, but not ex necessarily exclusively, Shia in green. And the red neighborhoods were areas that were predominantly, though not necessarily exclusively, populated by Sunni families. So um, again, as you can see, the normal, the normal pattern of um, residency in Baghdad prior to 2006 was really not based, uh, you know, of course, things like class, um, family affiliations, um, and, and other sort of uh, ways in which any city might result in certain patterns of, of, of urban settlement um, were much, much more important in determining where people lived um, than any kind of sectarian-based identity. Um, and just for your reference, uh, because it's a part of the city that I think everyone has heard about, the green zone, where it continues to be the seat of power, um, it was the seat of power um, largely of Saddam Hussein, um, it was the seat of power occupied, and this is when it became the green zone, the sort of walled area um, where uh, the, the U.S. occupation, where Paul Bremer um, and other uh, uh, occupying forces were based, um, and today continues to be the area from which the Iraqi government operates. Um, it's an incredibly fortified zone of the city, um, and it's located right there at the center. One thing that I will note is that in the upper right-hand side on the eastern bank um, of the Tigris River, which, which bisects Baghdad, um, you see Sadr City. Here it's referred to on the map as Saddam City. Before that, it was Athawra. So it's had all these sort of politically significant names um, that's changed the, the, the name of the city um, over time. But this is an area of the city that you can see is green. So it has always been a strong uh, uh, Shia uh, populated area of the city. It, the reason for that, however, is, has more to do with uh, uh, issues of class distribution rather than necessarily um, uh, sectarian distribution of residents. So it was actually a modern uh, modernist housing design that was designed by um, uh, a, a famous uh, uh, planner uh, in the 50s for the city and actually turn into basically public housing for the city. And so a lot of low-income residents who were mostly Shia families um, moved in there, and increasingly under Saddam's rule, um, there was an economic disenfranchisement of, of uh, Shia residents in the city. Um, and so it became this very sort of uh, densely populated part of the city um, that, that was, uh, until today, has, has remained like a very strong... Um, basis for uh, recruiting Shia, uh, particularly young men, into the ranks of uh, Muqtada al-Sadr's militia. So from Sadr City, um, beginning in 2006, the Mahdi army executed and coordinated its efforts to forcibly displace Sunni residents from the surrounding neighborhoods. As you can see, it was surrounded largely by these orange shaded neighborhoods. Um, in the aftermath of the al Askari bombing, uh, in an effort by the Mahdi army to seize control of territory in the city um, and transform it into a largely um, Shia-controlled area. So watch what happens to the orange. This is uh, the change from 2006 to 2007. So the campaign by the Mahdi army began by concentrating on the territories on the eastern side of the river on the right half, um, driving Sunnis out of neighborhoods that were adjacent directly to Sadr City. However, as of February 2007, the city had ended up not quite neatly divided into a uh, Shia East and a uh, Sunni West, but rather you can see there are certain neighborhoods um, like Azamiya, which is here, um, that effectively enclosed an area of the city that had been um, sort of repopulated strongly or exclusively by uh, Sunni residents and surrounding it by um, 
uh, neighborhoods that were controlled by the Mahdi army or populated by Shia, Shia residents. So neighborhoods like this became really uh, zones of the most violence and conflict in terms of um, street battles, um, violence that was, was out on the streets would be sort of on the borders of areas like Atamiya and other ones um, that became isolated in that way. Shia and Sunni militias engaged um, both in practices of, uh, uh, in, in many different practices in order to force people out of their homes. This included intimidation, so graffiti that would be sprayed um, telling people that anyone who, you know, you Saddam loyalists, your time in hell is very, very close. Um, asking that people send their sons to, to be part of the militias, um, as well as kidnapping. Um, women really were uh, primary targets for this kind of thing, so women increasingly were not able to be out in public during this period as much because they were really targets simply because they were women um, uh, of kidnapping. Um, murder, the killing of, of individuals, um, and uh, other forms of violence. Um, and these were means to drive out civilians identified with either sect from their homes. Um, the practices were carried out as explicit strategies to segregate the urban population according to sect. In Baghdad, death threats, bombings, kidnappings, and widespread fear forced the eviction of more than 400,000 Iraqis from their homes in this period, one year. Displaced residents who remained in the city, city typically moved to different neighborhoods, um, so it was internal, a phenomenon of internal displacement largely during this period. Um, so they would move to a different neighborhood that had come to, under the protection of a, of a sectarian militia that they could affiliate with. In general, Sunni residents fled to the formerly mixed neighborhoods that Shias had left and vice versa. Um, and reportedly, uh, although there were massive protests, people were, were doing by any means necessary trying to find a new place to live. So there was a lot of squatting of public buildings, schools, institutions. Um, there was also uh, occupation of, you know, someone who lived in a safer, relatively safer neighborhood or a protected neighborhood would invite other families to come live with them. So three families living in one home at a time, um, sort of these temporary measures. When it became clear that this was, this was not an issue that was going to be resolved very quickly, there were massive demonstrations, calls to the government to do something about the housing crisis um, and, uh, and the insecurity. Um, and it's actually, the Mahdi army was probably and local militias were most effective in addressing this, and they worked with local mosques to actually um, resettle families who had been displaced from one neighborhood into the homes of the families who had left that neighborhood. So coordinating um, that level of sort of relocation <coughs> at the neighborhood scale. While the Mahdi army campaign continued to expand its control westward, Sunni militias managed to keep control over a few key areas on either side of the river. <coughs> And by early 2007, an estimated uh, basically two-thirds of um, Baghdad's total population of 7 million reportedly lived in areas dominated by a single sect. So if you compare that to this map, and you consider that 75% of Baghdad's population lived in sectarian-based neighborhoods after 2007. As a result, residents across the city were cut off from normal access to jobs, education, and social networks, and forced to carve out new patterns of everyday life. Sectarian militias set up armed checkpoints, um, imposing random searches on individuals and automobiles. Paramilitaries often assumed a driver's passenger, uh, a driver or passenger's sectarian identity um, based on their name alone. So checking someone's ID, they would say, oh, he's Shia, he's Sunni, for example. Um, so in order to subvert that kind of militia surveillance, Iraqis increasingly acquired and carried two different jinsia, these ID cards. One would be an actual government-issued ID card, and the other would be a fake ID that had their picture but with a name that could be identified with the other sex. So depending on which checkpoint they came upon, they would deploy one ID card or the other. Not only fake IDs, but also official name changes, fake license plates, religious bumper stickers, and mobile ringtones um, served as markers that were used to manipulate the sectarian identity or the presumption of sectarian identity um, and increase one's mobility within the segregated city. By early 2007, U.S. military authorities identified isolated Sunni areas such as Atamiya and Dora and Hariya as some of the most targeted and hostile parts of the city. In April, 
of 2007, the U.S. military announced a plan to construct walls around these and other Sunni neighborhoods. So briefly, um, before 2006, walls were still characteristic of the occupation from the very beginning. As I mentioned, the green zone, um, a heavily fortified part of the city that protected um, occupying uh, establishment and military build uh, ministry buildings um, from uh, attack by the insurgent, the anti-occupation insurgency. Um, also, uh, central markets, hotels, and universities were surrounded either by barbed wire or blast walls, these sort of segments of walls, um, in order to keep out um, attacks and deter bombs. However, following the rise of sectarian-based displacement and the consolidation of militia-controlled territories in 2006, the U.S.-led multinational forces announced their plans to proliferate the walling strategy throughout the city um, into the neighborhoods of Baghdad, mostly on the streets that bordered the newly isolated Sunni and Shia areas, so areas like al hmm. David Kilcullen, uh, who is a senior counterinsurgency advisor to the multinational forces in Iraq, described plans to construct uh, these walls as the building of gated communities. Um, using something that we think of as being sort of benign, uh, part of our everyday lives here in the U.S. Um, but these were going to be constructed uh, out of barriers of 12-foot high, 14,000-pound T-shaped concrete segments um, that were used in order to reduce sectarian-based violence in what he described as three important ways. First, making it more difficult for terrorists to infiltrate a community, so protecting that community. Also by making it more difficult for the terrorists in that community to launch attacks on other communities. And third, by protecting the gated community against any kind of retaliation, reducing fear, and incre increasing cooperation with multinational forces. So this is from um, 2007, and this is, again, just like a snapshot of time. So at that time, these are all the different neighborhoods where the construction of these uh, these walls were documented. Um, the confirmed locations of the extensive construction of the security walls, uh, so-called security walls, along the perimeters of segregated Sunni and Shia neighborhoods, by the end of 2007, it's indicated by the darker shaded areas on the map. In western Baghdad, walls went up around Sunni neighborhoods including Dora, Amariya, um, Bazliya, as well as Shia-controlled Hariya area. East of the river, um, the construction worked strategically to enclose the Mahdi army stronghold in Sadr city, as well as the Sunni area of Adhemiya that, that I've already discussed extensively. And the green zone is, of course, also fortified, but it was sort of the old, uh, long-standing fortification, not the new strategy. So initially, there was a temporary drop in violence, and so the walls um, were, they were really, they were seen as a success initially in 2007. Um, yet they also served um, to not only sort of uh, keep militias from each other, but also to isolate Iraqis and their neighbors um, from one another, and also to make them dependent on militias like the Mahdi army for basic necessities. So, for example, for food, for supplies, for protection. Um, and rather than addressing any of the root causes of the sectarian-based violence, this basically attempted to freeze the conflict and concretize the urban character of political sectarianism um, at the level of everyday life, at the level of the street, at the level of where people could move, how they could live in the city. Residents immediately demonstrated the construction of the walls in significant numbers. This is in Ademiye, uh, where, for example, more than 2,000 protesters walked the streets with banners like this one, and the walls were regularly compared to walls in other places in the region and around the world, um, namely Israel's so-called security barrier in occupied Palestinian territories. The walls enclosing the segregated districts were punctuated not only by a limited were punctuated only by a limited number of entrance and exit checkpoints um, that were monitored around the clock by Iraqi policemen. So this is a different layer of checkpoints in the city in addition to the ones that the militias controlled within neighborhoods. Now you have these walls that are controlled by um, the police force checkpoints. And so as you can imagine, everyday issues, like if you can imagine the traffic on a Sand Hill Road, 
times 1 million. Um, and obviously the fear and anxiety around um, something happening, an incident happening while you're stuck in your car in traffic, the, the experience of being in the city um, is unfortunately dominated by, by that sort of sense of anxiety, um, really affecting people's decisions about where to go and priorities about um, how to move throughout the city. Checkpoints serve to aggravate all these conditions um, and in effect the flow of economic and social interactions is often confined to the territories designated by the system of barriers, changing the habits that, that people have in their everyday lives. For those Iraqi civilians living in the city of walls, the sight of endless barriers and oppressive concrete blast walls that flank the checkpoints, surround buildings and obstruct roads served as a quotidian reminder of the violent transformation of their city, of the occupation, and of sort of the lack of representation that they had had in any kind of new political process. <clears throat> so what do we do? We paint them. <laughs> Cecilia Pieri is an architectural and urban historian um, of Baghdad who's done tremendous work documenting a mun municipal beautification campaign that was initiated initiated in uh, 2007, very shortly after the, con the construction of these walls. The campaign initially commissioned artists, Iraqi artists, to paint colorful murals on the walls as a means to normalize the ubiquity of the gray cement objects that uh, had become sort of the new urban furniture in Baghdad. However, the walls ultimately, um, as, as her analysis really shows us, uh, operated not as a canvas, um, not as sort of a, a space intended for murals, but really as military objects. So what would happen with these walls was actually, um, they were not permanent structures. They've never been necessarily permanent structures. So a wall built on one street, once it's determined by military forces to not be really necessary anymore because violence has died down, they would pick it up and move it somewhere else. So when they would do that, they wouldn't necessarily put the murals back together as they had been intended mm. by the artist. So you would get a horse's head somewhere it didn't belong, for example. Um, really uh, exposing the nature of these as military objects um, and despite the attempts to sort of beautify them um, and, and uh, camouflage them um, as urban art. It's also important uh, to note that the walls had also been appropriated by local militias um, for use in um, however they saw fit. So they would actually paint, for example, at a checkpoint sort of how to uh, what to do when you arrive at a checkpoint, instructions with some visual um, uh, sort of uh, icons to, to help people uh, make it more expedient of people passing through. Um, or, for example, like the French ministry commissioned its own, uh, uh, the French consulate commissioned its own murals um, on the blast walls. Uh, the CPA's purported mission, um, and I'm going to sort of start to wrap up here, um, to initially restore conditions of security and stability and create conditions in which the Iraqi people could freely determine their own political future was clearly undermined um, since 2003 by the assumptions that were made about the Iraqi population and particularly um, sectarian identity. The political interventions in the first years of the occupation not only ensured the establishment of an exclusive and sectarian political system, but also facilitated new conditions of instability, insecurity, and ultimately segregation in Baghdad. Poignantly, residents in Baghdad nicknamed these concrete barriers Bremer Walls. <laughs> the walls and the spatial condition of segregation continues to characterize the city until today. Um, and actually, as an addendum to my talk, Today I opened the news and the AP and Reuters have reported that now Iraq, the Iraqi police force is building its own wall, repurposing a lot of these walls from within the city to build one big wall around Baghdad. <laughs> so the idea is to actually enclose Baghdad in a wall. And this is, of <coughs> course, um, it's a different context today. Uh, Ten years later, really, they're, they're thinking about protecting Baghdad from ISIS control and continued ISIS attacks. In the past month alone, 300 uh, Baghdad, just in Baghdad alone, 300 people have been killed in various attacks. Um, we don't hear about this in the news the way that we used to. It's sort of buried now. Uh, more than uh, 700, almost 800 people were wounded in these different attacks. So this is in one month alone. So we're talking about extraordinary levels of violence that continue until today. Um, and we can discuss 
and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about how uh, the problem with, uh, with ISIS today that we see in Iraq, particularly affecting Baghdad, um, is an extension of, of a lot of what I've discussed today. So, I'm going to wrap up actually with just one more, one more thing, which you might find interesting. Um, just in light, uh, because I'm, I'm still sort of digesting this news about the wall that's being constructed around um, Baghdad, but what it brings to mind is that um, when Baghdad was initially founded uh, by the Abbasid uh, Caliph al-Mansur in the 8th century, it was founded as a round city that was completely fortified by one wall. Um, and this was because the caliph was completely obsessed with the idea of security and his, actually his own personal security. Um, and so it was, it was founded as um, Baghdad, Medina to Salam, so the city of peace. Um, and he was convinced that this was going to be the perfect solution. So he built a wall a perimeter around the city. Um, ultimately, he discovered that he had built himself into a prison. Um, and there was an assassination attempt on his life, and he ended up actually leaving the city. So uh, I'm just sort of digesting that and reflecting on that in light of the reconstruction of a, of a, of a new wall around um, Baghdad. And I, I'll just leave it there. Thank you.